From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello and welcome to episode 213 of the Anxiety Project podcast. I am Brad Robinson. Today, I'm talking about my history with anxiety and more specifically health anxiety because this was unbelievably debilitating for me and I'll go over this journey with you guys. I find that a lot of the new people who stumble upon my channel, what they tell me is that my story of going through health anxiety really resonates with them because it seems like to them that no one is understanding what they're currently going through, their friends and family, their coworkers, and that's exactly how I felt. And that's exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing is because when I first went through this structured approach to anxiety recovery, I first met a coach that and looked up to a coach that went through the same suffering I was going through and they overcame that suffering and that brought a lot of hope into my sphere of uncertainty and self-doubt, self-criticism, catastrophizing and that was huge for me. That was a massive paradigm shift that there is actually a path out of this. What is it? And so I was starving. I was starving for that information and I became obsessed about getting that information from that mentor. And so I restructured my my life around this recovery plan and you know, you just stumble forward. It's just That's how you recover from anxiety. You find a teacher, you start to learn, and you start to stumble forward by implementing these new strategies because things get worse before they get a lot better. And what I mean by that is when you start to look inwards at the truth, you start to realize that there is a lot there that you need to unpack and resolve and heal from. And that's overwhelming, right? It's like Moses leading his people out from the tyranny into the desert, right? The desert is better than the tyranny, but you're in a desert now. You're wandering around and yeah, you have to make order out of that chaos. I mean, the tyranny, like, my unconscious old self, I was like a tyrant over over that Brad, right? I was living a lifestyle that had to be perfect, that had to be that had to meet all my needs. It I was self-sabotaging myself unconsciously. And that's what it means to be unconscious, right? You're just you're just going with your impulses and you're just acting out those impulses without any conscious awareness without, you know, I had to develop that conscientiousness during my recovery. But anyways, I moved out from the tyranny of that unconsciousness that I was in and that self-sabotage out into this recovery domain, which is the desert. But then in that recovery domain, I had to establish a lot of order within that chaos of recovery because I was learning a bunch of new things. I was learning how to meditate and then I was learning how to live life without caffeine and then live life without sugar and then live life without the negative toxic friend and then live life without weed and then pornography and then all of these things. And that was a great, great journey. And that required me to look inwards at what I needed to burn off in order for me to have less and less anxiety because I was at a level 10 anxiety every damn day. So why I started to do this coaching and the podcast, I'll tell you something. I never imagined 
my life going this way. I was always thinking, well, I would like some sort of fame. I'd like some sort of fortune. Maybe I'll become an actor. Maybe I could work, you know, become successful in the movie industry. Or, you know, I, I had these grandiose ideas. And, and I, you know, I, I did work in the film industry. I was working on film sets. Uh, before I left the film industry, I was a camera assistant, camera trainee to be more uh, specific and I was on set uh, 18 hours a day and I really enjoyed it my passion is movies I love movies right and I, I, I've always loved movies since I was a kid and I really wanted to work and create my own material but I was going through anxiety recovery at the time and I found my passion m- in this recovery because I was overcoming this ginormous mountain that I had to confront and, and well, yeah, confront. But a big part of that was being honest with myself that there was actually a mountain there because I was ignoring that mountain for most of my life. And I remember one day sitting in the coffee shop and thinking about my first podcast. And, you know, I had to start from square one. Literally, I had no followers. I had no idea what would come of it. But I was, I knew that if I could touch one person's life and change that person's life because of the anxiety that I overcame and and the agoraphobia that I got out of and the generalized anxiety disorder that I got myself out of, then that would be worthwhile. And I found so much meaning, not just helping other people or not, or the idea of helping other people at that time, but I, a lot of the meaning came into my life when I saw myself progressing in some manner towards an aim because I spent most of my life quitting things when things got tough. I spent most of my life um, relying on other people, family especially, for support and to help me. And I, in my uh, mid to later 20s, I viewed myself as a weak person I looked at myself as someone who is timid, afraid, shy, uh, incapable, hopeless. And I can't believe that I came from that place. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I love more than anything to help other people who are in those periods of despair, that there is actually a way out because I myself thought that there was no way out. And I, I, I myself thought that anxiety and pain and suffering was going to be my normal forever. And I would just have to, you know, rely on weed or alcohol or, you know, uh, pornography, whatever it was to reassurance, doctor visits, medications, uh, even though I I didn't go on them, but you know, I would have eventually have gotten there if I were to continue down the path I was on. And, I was I was desperate to change. My whole body was screaming out to me, "Hey Brad, you have to change. You have to do something about this." And yeah, it's a sign. Anxiety is a sign. The suffering that you're going through is a sign that your strategies aren't working and that you need to adjust and move more into the unknown. So, firstly, Does anxiety go away? Does it go away? Well, the severity of your anxiety, that will go away. You can reduce the severity of your anxiety. The every 
day level 10 anxiety, that can be reduced. Absolutely. It must be reduced. It, it has to because our bodies are not designed to run at level 10 anxiety over a long, long period of time because it ages you rapidly. It causes illness. Your body isn't able to heal and rejuvenate and regenerate. Your body needs to relax and calm down. And if you are human, then anxiety will continue to play a certain role in your life. And it must, right? You're a human being. Anxiety is there for a reason. But it doesn't have to be the prominent factor of you. You can rise above anxiety. You can live most of your life anxiety-free and anxiety will pop up periodically. But at that point, you will have enough confidence and tools in your tool belt to handle that chaos and that novelty appropriately because your glass won't be overflowing with water, right? My emotional reservoir of my old self that was at a level 10. That was overflowing, right? Any novelty that came into my day, a drop, would send me into extreme panic or extreme emotional distress, anger, frustration, a lot of that. And I remember my old self being so sensitive to anything that was related to health. And so if someone in the coffee shop were to say the word cancer, or if I would hear something on the radio, or if I see a or if I see a billboard, then I would perk up and be like, oh my God, I have that. I have that. And this is my reticular activating system working appropriately, right? Because I was placing my health and my health concerns at top value. That was what was most valuable to me because I was feeling these strange bodily sensations. So I was fixated on my bodily sensations. And so because I was so fixated, I was putting my health and these strange symptoms at number one of what I value. So every day, every day I wake up, I'm focusing in on my symptoms everywhere I go. If I hear the word cancer, I'm focusing in and I'm perking up and I'm being overly stimulated. If I see a doctor show on TV or, or see some blood on TV, then I'm, I perk up and I get overly sensitive and my emotional reservoir was overflowing, right? That's what it was doing. And I, I was, because I was so obsessive over my symptoms, this was a sign that I was trying to solve the problem. Because I was so hyper-focused, my, I was just unconsciously telling myself, like, there's a problem here and I need to solve it. There's a problem, I need to solve it. And then I started to do that in the wrong ways, right? I started to do reassurance seeking, Dr. Google, uh, going to my doctor, phoning my doctor, uh, talking about my symptoms to other people, uh, checking my urine constantly, checking on my body constantly. Uh, you know, going like when I would go on Dr. Google, I would there would be a suggestion because I thought I would say I would have kidney disease or a UTI, for example. And on Google it says to help a UTI, drink some cranberry juice. And I would, I would be like, okay, cranberry juice, got it. So I'd run out, get cranberry juice, chug it back until, you know, I feel better. But I wasn't feeling better because I was, I was not target, targeting the underlying issue, right? I, I thought I had a UTI, but I didn't have a UTI. It, it was just the symptoms caused by my anxiety making me think that, there was a problem in that certain area when there was absolutely no problem there. Uh, I was I was not targeting the the underlying problem. The problem was my trauma, my anxiety, and 
lessening my anxiety and and overcoming and healing from that trauma within me. So there was a lot there. But, you know, at the beginning of my journey, I didn't know any of that. I was just trying to solve the problem. So where did I begin? So having a structure was crucial for me. Absolutely crucial. And I go over this with my clients because they are in total disorder. They're they're just flopping out of bed and their day-to-day is in total chaos. So... Look at anxiety disorder, disorder, order that is disrupted. You you have to add order. It's so important. And then simplifying my days a little at a time. That was necessary. This involved me spending quality time with myself, something I severely neglected. I didn't even know who I was. I had this identity my ego projected, but that identity sucked. It sucked because I felt weak. I felt helpless. I felt lost. And I was unbelievably afraid of the world around me. The world around me grew into a dragon that was way too great for me to take on. Every day became a struggle. Every day became a struggle for me to stand up and face the day. So much so that I eventually stayed home every day, and this resulted in agoraphobia. I couldn't even walk a block from my house without having a severe panic attack and coming home. Because the more you avoid those situations where you feel like you might lose control and die and then be judged by other people, the more you avoid that, the more you're going to shrink your world down so damn small that even walking a block from your safe place, your home, is going to make you feel like you might lose control and not have someone close by to help you. And also you might make a fool out of yourself in in in, in, in front of someone else's yard, right? So I, I, stay, I just stayed home at that point. And so every day was a struggle. And can you imagine how intimidating life becomes when you decide to avoid life altogether. It's it's too daunting to take on. The dragon is so big at that point, you feel the most hopeless, lost, and alone. That's a huge word here, alone. Because now, the people around you, they can't really help you, can they? Because they don't understand what you're going through. They're just telling you, hey, you know, just have a beer, relax, or everything will be okay. They give you a pat on the back. It's analgesic. It makes you feel good for a moment. But then when they leave the room, you're in total shock and your anxiety rises and you feel alone. Because if they're saying one thing and you feel another thing, then that's that's not a good thing to that's not a good place to be. You need to find a mentor and I hope hopefully I can be that for you. You have to find that mentor to help you understand that this is anxiety and it's anxiety because of these symptoms because you feel this way, because you're thinking these thoughts, because you're behaving in this certain way. And there is a way to change all of that in order to lessen anxiety and get out of it. And not only that, anxiety is so common. We live in an age of anxiety. And when I was overcoming anxiety, I looked back on my relationships and I recognized that all the most of the people I was hanging around were suffering from anxiety and I didn't even know it because I was suffering from anxiety. And when all these people who have the same thing and are, are going through the same thing are together, it just seems like the normal, right? But you don't kind of realize that everyone is going through their own dragon, their own demons, and that Anxiety is very, 
very common. And suffering from severe anxiety is very, very common. And so now I want to get into the habits I was doing every day because this was making up my anxious identity. All of the the potholes I was stepping in unconsciously every day and things needed to be sacrificed in order to move on in my life, you know, habits, beliefs, values, friendships. So, but in this case, I want to talk about my habits. And here's the thing. Most of that novelty that was coming into my life every day that I was having a hard time battling with, that could be prevented if only I just oriented myself properly and I made the right sacrifices. So let me elaborate on this because it's complicated when I just say it like that, right? Because we have more control over our circumstance than we think. So many people who have the victim mentality, they say, oh, I'm just dealt a bad hand. Oh, I'm, you know, God just doesn't like me. The world doesn't like me. No, that's actually the story of Cain, right? Cain, God comes to Cain in the Cain and Abel story. God comes to Cain and God's like, well, Cain, I know you're suffering here, but you could make better sacrifices than the sacrifices you're making now. But Cain doesn't want to acknowledge that because he has to then confront his own inadequacies. So instead of looking towards Abel and really taking in what Abel's doing right, because Abel's doing something right, you know, for God to for God to admire or and and support Abel in that way and then Cain but instead Cain he decides to shake his fist at God and Abel and say you know what to hell with it um I don't like you guys you guys are against me he refuses to confront his own truth he refuses to confront his own inadequacies, and that's only going to drive him more into unconsciousness, which, you know, it does. We The more unconscious you become, the more impulsive you become. And you know what? Because he's brooding on, on this resentment for so long, he actually kills his ideal. He kills Abel, the person that he should be learning from. He kills that. And then he tells God, well, my suffering is too much for me to bear. Because once you kill your ideal, now what? Where's your North Star? Abel was supposed to be Cain's North Star. Cain should have went up to Abel and say, hey, Abel, there's a lot for me to learn. What am I doing wrong? And can you help me out? But he doesn't do that. He does not even go there. So... Here's the thing with my old habits is that I was stepping into these potholes every day that I was refusing to acknowledge and confront. And you see this in the movie Groundhog Day because in this movie, I mean, this is a brilliant movie. We see the main character, Phil. He's stepping into the same puddle puddle every day. He's stepping into the same pothole. And what's interesting is that he starts to pay attention to the feedback and then he starts to open his eyes and he becomes honest with himself. Okay, there's this pothole here. Maybe if I should walk over it, then that'll make my day even a little bit better, right? Even if it's 1% better, that's unbelievable. So he stops walking in the pothole. But it's interesting because the in Groundhog Day, the, he's reliving the same day over and over and over again. And To an unconscious person, that's absolutely true. An unconscious person relives the same day over and over and over again until they can open their eyes and acknowledge the change that could be made around them. Notice the mess. 
Be honest with yourself. Is there a mess around you? What are your negative habits or what's causing you a lot of pain and suffering? And you have to define that for your own self. So, and that will come if you really ask yourself, it will come up from the depths of your being, wherever that is, but it does come up. And so acknowledge that, hey, man, I'm stepping into this pothole. Maybe I should not do that, right? So in Groundhog Day, Phil, he starts to become more conscientious. And he moves from unconsciousness into conscientiousness. And that's so cool. So the movie is about how to move from pain and suffering to finding meaning in one's life. It's unbelievable. But anyways, my old habits had a Medusa-like quality to them. You know, the, I think, Greek mythological character of the the woman with the head of snakes. And when you confront her, she turns you to stone. Well, my old habits were like that, right? The, the Medusa, you know, One habit produces many negative outcomes. One habit has like 10 snakes attached to it. So for example, like staying up until 2 a.m. Or spending the day with a negative friend. Because when I would do that, I'm neglecting work. I'm neglecting other responsibilities that begin to stack up. It's emotionally draining because he was a negative friend because he had a lot of anxiety and the energy that he exuded was very, very draining. And then if I were to hang around him, I would spend a lot, uh, I would spend less quality time with myself and I wouldn't grow. I wouldn't develop. I would just stay in that circle of impulsivity. It's like staying on pleasure Island, right? There's a lot of consequences being stuck in unconsciousness because time is passing you by and you're not growing. You're not developing. You're not burning away the parts of you that aren't working. You're staying in the state of Cain, brooding and not developing and not venturing forth into the unknown. So by reducing one negative habit, you're greatly reducing anxiety. But you have to define what negative is in your life. One way you can do that is compare yourself to, you know, the mentor that you are looking up to. What, what's working for them? What's working for them? Because you have to learn somewhere, right? You have to learn from somebody who came from that same place, but also overcame it. And then I want to get into today, what was it like to suffer with health anxiety? Well, I talked about this already, but I was constantly obsessing over my health. And then I was reacting over my health. But then there would be a lot of catastrophic thoughts associated to this cycle. And so I remember going on walks with my parents. And then the whole walk, I was thinking, what if my parents die? What if this happens to them? What if that happens to them? And I would get so caught up in this thinking that I would, I, it dragged me so far down into pain. I couldn't even believe it. But at the bottom of that pain, I think I was afraid that if they were to leave this earth, I wouldn't have them to lean on when I needed them because I I relied on them most my life. That's actually part of that fear. I mean, there, there are things at the bottom of your catastrophic thoughts that you need to unpack. It's complicated, but they're, they are there and you need to well, unpack them and and shine light on them. And also I needed to learn that these thoughts didn't, don't make me God. It doesn't make me God. Like they're going to come true because I reacted to them. Like if I thought them, they would come true, right? But I needed to observe them rather than play into their hand because it was a part of my being that was, it was it was coming into my my mind the thought and then i was it was playing itself out 
and I had an opportunity to dance with it or not dance with it, but I would dance with it. You don't have to dance with it because if you do, then you're showing yourself that this is something that you value and you're strengthening that circuit. So over time through CBT work, I learned how to approach negative thinking and mindfulness was one way and you can do that through meditation which greatly helped me and then spending less time in front of the tv spending more time with myself and my mind talking to myself in a different way and then confronting my fears through nlp work and that's neuro-linguistic programming reframing those traumatic experiences absolutely massive so when i was suffering from anxiety my whole being it felt like a dam like a a dam that was holding too much water and it was putting so much force on the structure my whole being was just just stressed out to the max and I needed to release that water that built up over the course of my life. So the beginning steps I decided to take when overcoming anxiety was to learn as much as possible from my role model. The person that went through the same suffering and got out of it. So I was learning, I was learning, I was learning. I became obsessed about this information like I was starving for it and that's because I was starving for it I can remember meaning starting to seep into my existence I was moving in some sort of direction rather than the circles I've been in for so long I became higher self-centered this is now a battle between me and myself I can no longer lean on the relationships around me. This journey is now a relationship between me and my teacher. And I remember sitting in my garage at the height of my agoraphobia, learning from my mentor and learning and writing stuff down and watching video after video after video and writing. And that was my square one. And that's where I'm going to leave you on today's podcast episode. Thank you, everybody, for being here with me today. I hope that this episode resonated with you. If you know somebody who is suffering from anxiety, I'm sure you do. Please share this with them because it could change the trajectory of their life. That's huge. Now, I do want to recommend some podcast episodes for you to check out that I did before that greatly relate to this one. I mean, you got to check these out after listening to this. Episode 202 and... Here I talk about agoraphobia. What is agoraphobia and how do you overcome agoraphobia? Great, powerful episode. And then episode 208, the first steps in recovery. Check that out and re-listen to these episodes religiously because they need to be greatly ingrained within your unconscious mind. And then lastly, I want to recommend a great book called Rewire Your Anxious Brain by Pittman and Carl. That is an outstanding book on the amygdala and the cortex, how these pathways cause anxiety. And I love the writing of this book because it's in layman's terms. You can easily understand it. It's it's uh, neuroscience, but at its simplest form, it's it's great. And that's where I'm going to leave you guys. So thank you so much. Remember to rise above anxiety. I will see you on the next episode. Bye for now. 
Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project Program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com for more details. Recovery starts now.